Hey everyone, Jason Shawcross of the Fantasy Football Sackos here, coming to you live from Quarantine Land, aka my spare bedroom. Um, Alex and I have a great episode lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about who we are, why the fantasy football sackos should matter to you, our listener, and then we're going to be doing a deep dive on some fantasy football content for you. We're going to be talking about who's made the worst offseason move so far. As a Bears fan, it pleasures me to say I'm looking at you, Green Bay Packers. And then, of course, we're going to be talking about our favorite rookies for the season. With that, let's get into it. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Sackos Podcast with your hosts, Jason Shalcross and Alex Krog. Let's go! All right! First podcast. How are we feeling? We are live and recorded. Live and recorded. Hey, 100% remote. This is same quality as all the other high quality podcasts out there. <laughs> we got this. That's right. So, welcome everyone. We are the Fantasy Football Sackos. I am Jason Shellcross, and my better looking half is Mr. Alex Krogh. Alex, how are we doing? How's quarantine treating you? Uh, doing okay. Um, haven't shaved in like five months. Haven't gotten a haircut in four months. Uh, started using, yeah, started using conditioner on my hair. Uh, <laughs> Uh, essentially, it's like uh, having a bowl cut back in seventh grade again, uh, minus the bowl cut. But maybe someday that'll probably be happening before this is over. Oh, that is excellent. Well, your hair looks conditioned and beautiful. So it, yeah, well conditioned. You'll notice I'm wearing a hat. Not a hat guy. Never have been. Uh, I don't think I have gotten a haircut in more than two months. And if I take it off, I look homeless. So. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the reason for the hat. So hopefully, hopefully soon we can get both of our heads taken care of. Yeah, you need to work on your beard too. I'm a little, oh little my god, not coming in better than that, honestly. I so I had it, I had it grown out for I want to say four weeks, and I have never ever in my in my life grown my beard out for that long. And Katie refused, my fiance refused to have anything to do with me like would not even want to sit on the same couch with me. She would just see me and I'd go like this because it got so long. Oh man, it was, so she she basically told me, today's the day, you're trimming it up. And here we are. So now a little bit trim beard, but hopefully. Okay, so, that, so that's the real reason why your wedding got postponed. It wasn't because of the coronavirus, it was because you were growing your beard out too far. Exactly, and if you saw what was under this hat, you would also say <laughs> same thing. All right, so welcome everybody. We are the Fantasy Football Sackos. This is a brand new podcast. We are here to talk fantasy football and other things, of course, like haircuts. Apparently. So, so this is sort of our first intro video. We are gonna talk fantasy football, but also our history with fantasy football and what's the worst and best things that have happened to us, some advice that we have, very broad general stuff. We'll get in more detailed stuff later on in the summer and going into the fall as we get closer to playing ball games. And so with that, I just wanna dive right in, Alex, why are we the fantasy football sackos? Let's go with question number one. So good question. Um, I mean, we definitely had to put the O's on the end because fantasy football sacks just doesn't sound quite as good. Doesn't have the ring to it. And I think yeah, the logos. So, yeah, the, <laughs> the logos. The, the, the O. Interesting. Yeah, the O is very important on on the end of end of that phrasing. You can probably figure out the rest if you really put your mind to it. I think our look a little bit different like uh almost like a kicker kicking the kicking like uh uprights of a man's anatomy or something like that so um it, we, we definitely had to change it up a little bit to go with the sackos you know you uh you were kind of the brain the brains behind the sackos i think and for say, me yeah i think for me when when it's why the sackos it's because and this also goes into it dovetails nicely into why we think people should listen to us is because I'm not an expert in fantasy football. You aren't an expert in fantasy football. I think I am in my head though. Right, we think we are and we're gonna yeah. argue like we are and I can tell yeah. you that you're already wrong, but, <laughs> and, I'm, and I have my convictions, but I mean, at the end of the day, a large, large portion of whether or not you're successful in fantasy football 
is honestly blind luck. You don't know when an injury is going to hit. You don't know if a coach is going to put a player in the doghouse when you draft him. I mean, all of those things are completely unpredictable. You just have to hope that it doesn't affect your team. And so we don't want to be the type of people that say we're 100 percent right at the time, all the time. We're the experts, we're the gurus, we're the guys that you need to listen to. We're saying these are our thoughts and opinions. We are just like you. We're trying to do the best as we can. We're trying to bring home that title. Um, you and I have been fairly successful at that lately, but I certainly didn't start out that way in fantasy football, and I don't really think very many people do. So Yeah, I mean, you're, you're spot on. And, and I would just like to add to that, like, you know, you can make your luck to a certain extent by just being prepared and, and looking at different things. And, you know, that that's going to be a big a big focus of kind of what we're talking about is just being prepared. Um, you know, you, you, you really do make your own luck a lot of times. So there, there is some luck, but you know, a lot of us have our, have the fantasy football leagues that we're in currently. And you kind of know before the season who you're, who's probably going to be in the top half of the league and who's going to be in the bottom half of the league. Um, I will yeah. name those people's names. At the for point. our league anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, what, what half do you think you're in? Let's just say that we have a couple people that are more consistent toward yeah. one end versus the other. Like, it's hilarious. We looked at my fantasy football record over the years and how it progressed. And first year, 12th in the league. Second year, I got lucky. I drafted Ladanian Tomlinson when he set the NFL rushing touchdown record. Finished second because he didn't play, but you know, he carried me the whole season. What I don't have much to complain about there. But yeah, that, that was 15 years ago for the record. Yeah, 15 years ago. See, yeah. we got 30 years of experience. <laughs> We're like 50 year old, well, you know, experienced employees with all of the technical education it takes in fantasy football. To be. Except we're not getting paid like we've been working for 30 years, but that's a different different conversation. Absolutely. And my fiance lets me know that we're not getting paid to, to do this. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I want to dive into our first bit of fantasy football takeaway. What is the worst real life football move that you think has been made so far this offseason? Yeah, it's a good question. There, there's a couple things. So for me, there's a clear cut one. I'm going to start at number two, though. My, my number two worst move is, is actually the Cowboys signing Amari Cooper to a five year contract uh, worth one hundred million dollars for a wide receiver. That's wildly inconsistent at best, you know, just kind of doing some research. So he's the second highest paid wide receiver um, based on his new contract. Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's relatively high. So theoretically, he would be the second best wide receiver. Um, and I do not think that's the case. I don't uh, think it's close. No, not at all. Um, and, you know, it really does restrict being able to sign Dak Prescott down the line. So it's like when you're even just discussing those two things alone, it's awful. But so, do you think, do you yeah, think I mean, that I'm, they're even worried about signing Dak Prescott, given the fact that they did sign Andy Dalton? I mean, Andy Dalton looks like me. Um, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to disqualify. Yeah, I, I don't want to dis discredit people with red hair, but I, I feel like that automatically brings you down a notch. Um, but it is luscious. Yeah, yeah. I, but come on, uh, he, he is not not on Dak Prescott's level. So, you know, you always got to pay the quarterback. You got to keep the quarterback healthy uh, healthy and happy and, and keep him paid. I, I know we're going to talk about the Packers here in a little bit, but it's like, you know, you don't want to do anything to make your star quarterback angry. So it's one of those things where it's like, why, why give this guy all this money? You know, he was the ninth best wide receiver in fantasy last year, depending on, on the statistics you look at. So he was good, but he was wildly inconsistent. He'd be way up. He'd be way down. And that's, um, been so that, his, that's been Amari's MO yeah. his whole career. He's completely disappeared in games. I don't know why you turn around and make that guy the number two highest player at his position. It doesn't, it didn't make sense to me. And because when people looked at the Cowboys the last couple off seasons, what do they do? They, they held up these three stars in Z Zeke, Amari, and Dak, and they said, these three stars hold up the Cowboys team and they have to get paid. Well, my opinion, Zeke is star one, Dak is star two, and Amari is a very good receiver who is not number two at his position. And when you lift up one of those guys, you invariably, I think, 
harm your ability to retain the other two. So I'm yeah. completely on the same page with you there. So what do you got next? Right. And, and two of the three have gotten paid the last two years. Um, and, right. and probably the most important person hasn't. So, you know, just, just as, like to win a Super Bowl, you got to have a quarterback and he's the quarterback. If you don't have him, you have Andy freaking Dalton. So it's like, really, is that is that what you want? Right. Hey, it's Jerry Jones world. We're just all living in it. Absolutely. Yeah. The the worst the worst thing that I've seen though this offseason, it's not even close, is is the DeAndre Hopkins trade um, oh. since to to the Arizona Cardinals. You know, you're you're looking at one of the best fantasy wide receivers. You're looking at one of the best real life receivers that we've seen in a while. Um, last year was wide receiver five with Deshaun Watson down in Houston and you know, he he was great. He's been one of the best for a long time and they got what like a second round pick because they didn't want to pay him. And they used that second round pick to trade for Brandon Cooks, who's terrible. <laughs> well, um, don't you, he's but not Brandon terrible, Cooks, but he, hate is real. Uh, he's had a bunch of concussions. He's one more hit away from you know never playing again. And you traded one of the a potential Hall of Fame wide receiver just because he didn't get along with the head coach and, and GM. So um, for me, that's by far and away the worst uh, off season move. What was on uh, your your to do list there? So I want to take not one move, but I want to take a series of moves and put them together and say collectively it did next to nothing to help a very successful team win now. And as you already said, it's the Green Bay Packers draft. Look, people, we're not biased. We might be biased. If you can see the video stream that's going to be posted on YouTube at the FF Sackos, we are proud Chicago Bears fans. That's right. However, we also understand you and I being football fans in general and fantasy football fans that Aaron Rodgers is one of, if not the best or top five quarterbacks of maybe all time, top 10, absolutely. From, and from a talent standpoint, he's great. He might, he doesn't have the Super Bowl wins, but I mean, from an accurate and well, honest Well, Tom would yeah. let him win one, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you take Aaron Rodgers and he is what, 36 this season? He's signed as a UFA. Uh, he won't be a UFA until 2024. He signed through his age 40 season. Okay. He does not have a lot of weapons. I'm going to put it nicely. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of weapons. I had a, He's got Devante, who's really good. Their running backs are fine, but they, there's no running backs are tight fine end. through this season, and they haven't had a tight end, and they try to backfill with slow Jimmy Graham, who's now gone. Yay, Chicago Bears for signing Jimmy Graham. <sighs> Story for another day. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction on that one. But then you have Devante, but... You know, he goes down, he had turf toe, you had Geronimo Allison go out with a series of injuries last year, and you were putting in bench fodder as your backups, and so you don't get any wide receiver help for your 36-year-old quarterback who should be in a win-now situation, and so it was very questionable to me. And then not only that, but who do you decide to draft? It's not like you pick a lineman instead, you don't take a tight end or a defensive guy. No, what do you do? You spend a first round pick on Jordan Love, a three year starter for Utah State, who led the FBS in interceptions last year with 17. He completed 62% of his passes. Now, it, do, it doesn't make it. It's it wonderful make as a Bears back. fan. It's great. I, I, it I, is. So, I, I was on a, a video call with several friends during the draft. We, we basically argue which team is going to draft which player. And I kid you not, the Packers come up on the clock and I said, they're taking Jordan Love here and it's going to be a bomb in that room and everybody's going to explode. Nobody believed me on the video chat. Half of them are Packers fans. They picked Jordan Love. And so everybody's streaming this event. And so my stream was like two seconds ahead. I threw, threw my screen, my stream device up and just started screaming. And then I got to hear them listen to the news. And it was glorious because they were so upset as Packers fans that uh, the Packers would draft Jordan Love. Now, what I will say is this. I'm going to argue the other side of this point. Maybe, and, and it also has to do with their second round pick, A.J. Dillon, running back out of Boston College. He's uh, the thunder to Aaron Jones' lightning, we'll say. Okay, he's 
more a little bit of a slower, straightforward, lower the shoulder, run you over kind of old school running back that isn't as, you know, flashy as the Aaron Jones. But, however, Aaron Jones is on his last year of his contract and is a free agent next year. So what I think happened is they fell in love with AJ Dillon, who had an amazing combine, ran a 4-5-340, put up 23 bench reps. Now, I think that they fell in love with AJ Dillon. They had see a 36-year-old quarterback at the helm of their team. And then you have this third thing, which is the coronavirus and all of the questions that surround that and how they've seen several other sports leagues and teams and even individuals in sport including people in the nfl be diagnosed with it and think maybe there won't be a season this year maybe we won't have football maybe football is in 2021 or if we do it's drastically changed in some way. And either either way, we are robbed of football and we are robbed of Aaron Rodgers' potential last few seasons. And so what we need to do is we're going to lose our running back at the end of the season anyway. We have a 36-year-old Aaron Rodgers. Maybe we should look towards the future because we don't know what's going to happen with this season. And maybe that's what their explanation is. I don't think that they'll say that to anybody. I think they're just going to say Jordan Love is a quality player with a lot of upside and we think that he's a very capable quarterback so we picked him and it was a late first round pick which gives us the extra year on his rookie contract if we choose to exercise it if he does pan out and maybe that's how they try to justify it. If he's good I'm going to be pissed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to be 32 here in a couple of months, and literally, basically, since I was born, they've had two Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Yeah, um, back they, to back. And, and oh, by the way, the Bears have had zero. Um, no, but we've had like 25 some odd quarterbacks in that same time. Though. Yeah. So, uh, um, God, I, we're going to hit eventually. You know, as a Bears fan, I'm absolutely terrified that Jordan loves good. Right. The other part of me wants wants to celebrate Pacmas and and them sucking as much as possible. So, I, I feel like we're, we're like a little cousin. Explain Pacmas to the people. Pacmas is is my little fun creation to needle all of uh, Packers Nation and all of the the stockholders and shareholders of of. Packers Nation, where they paid X amount of money to get absolutely nothing in return. A piece of paper! Um, but uh, they did get a piece of paper. Uh, it's it's my uh, my annual celebration uh, of them not winning uh, another world title. They've had two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, again, for the last 30 years. They've won two titles, one on the arm of Brett Favre, one against the uh, Seahorse team that just didn't seem like they were in it. I believe that was 2011. I really love celebrating Packers tears. Um, they're among my favorite, especially when they're up, what is it, 14 against the Seahawks in the fourth quarter Ooh. championship Ooh. game and blowing that and losing in overtime. Just so so many fond memories of Packers. So, um, yeah. Looking forward to bringing that to the masses here in the next couple of months, for sure. You know, and Packers fans talk a lot of junk to us because we're Bears fans. But at the same and rightfully time, so. They, yeah, right. I mean, we, we deserve it, for and sure. We've had a lot of underachieving seasons and letdowns in key moments. I will go back to the Super Bowl where we basically didn't have a chance against Peyton Manning's Indianapolis Colts that entire game. But that's neither here nor there, even though we are not making the playoffs because we are in a very up division and 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 all of that it is still satisfying to see the packers drop out every year because that's what they do get so far they make the playoffs and then they get eliminated and you just see aaron Rodgers without the talent he needs around him yep. and they always talk about getting him more and then they draft the backup quarterback and a slow running back behind him. so cheers to that yeah, absolutely terrible. Look, looking forward to them being bad for the next 20 years. But Oh, cheers to that. Yeah, All right. Absolutely. So moving on, what is the one team that you would like to stay away from this year? And not, not in like cheering for them, but their players for fantasy football. If there was one team as a collective whole, you see this player on this team who is ranked similarly to another player on a different team and you choose this other player 
just because he's not on that team. Where are you avoiding? It kind of seems like every year you kind of end up with the same players based on your analysis of, oh, you know, yeah. who's going to be good, who's going to be bad. Um, if you know, I could get multiple teams. If yeah. I could get McCaffrey every year, I would. <laughs> sure, of course. I mean, who wouldn't, right? But for me, it's it could be could be the Washington Redskins. They, they don't have a whole lot in the in the cabinet with Haskins and Darius Geis and your boy Mc, McLaurin, um, who, who I know you love. But um, for F one baby, yeah. For for me, it's uh, it's definitely the New York Jets, uh, and and it really actually doesn't have that much to do with the players. It has to do with the coaching. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure we all remember uh, Adam Gase's uh, press conference where, you know, his eyes kind of bugged out. Here I have a little prop kind of looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> is that their I'm press not, conference not, or is that their football play? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not calling Adam Gase a turd by any imagine, but um, his eyes kind of bugged out and uh, oh feel God. relatively is, accurate see, representation. And for hold yeah. on, so so for the people that are not watching this on YouTube, uh, I, I would like to clarify that uh, my colleague Alex here has a stuffed poop emoji that he is holding up to the camera and comparing the Adam Gase and New York Football Jets. So thank you, Alex, for including props on the first show. We can check that off. Yep. Yes. Yeah, anytime we can talk about poop. Um, I'm all about it. So Adam, Adam Gase, right? So, you know, I, I don't even know how this guy still has a job, which is kind of aggressive. But I mean, he he was the offensive coordinator for, for the Denver Broncos. They had Peyton Manning, uh, where he, you know, set, set the records and, and did, you know, did some different things. Their running back at that time was no Sean Moreno. A fun name to say. Uh, he had a thousand yards, ten rushing touchdowns, sixty catches, and I overdrafted him every season after that. Yeah, it, right. I mean, that was that was the only year he did anything in in 2013, and that, that was when Peyton had 55 passing touchdowns. And so, as the offensive coordinator, you look great, right? In 2014, Peyton had 39 passing touchdowns. C.J. Anderson, 850 yards, eight touchdowns. And then John Fox got fired and Adam Gase followed John Fox to the Bears where our, our guy, uh, Jay Cutler, put up 3,600 passing yards and 21 touchdowns. Ooh. So good year uh, for the running backs. The, the only year he was in Chicago. Matt Forte, Jeremy Langford combined for 1,400 rushing yards, 10 touchdowns. Wow. 66 catches, 650 yards. So like all good stuff up until then. What, what started happening was after he went to to take the, the head coach job in Miami, I think they actually made the playoffs his first year in Miami in 2016. They lost in the first round. But Ryan Tannehill, under 3,000 yards passing, 19 touchdowns, to picks. Jay Ajayi, 1,200 yards. Uh, Jarvis Landry, 94 catches, 1,200 yards. So, like, good numbers, but all downhill. What I want to point out about that, though, is... yeah. What those guys went on to do and how they went on to produce elsewhere After outside that. of the Adam Gase yeah. system, if you want to even call it a system. Tannehill looked like a revelation in Tennessee this past season and got a handsomely rewarded contract because of it. And you look at what Jarvis Landry has done in Cleveland. Sure, it hasn't been great, but I think that that's mostly a byproduct of the quarterback play and not because of his own talent. So you look at what Adam Gase did, you could argue, you could easily argue that he, well, just squandered the talent and didn't take advantage of the situation that he was in. So I, I'm 100% on the uh, the Adam Gase train that you're rolling on, but let's let's talk about the Jets then. So you're so, staying away from Le'Veon, you're staying away from everybody. Staying away from everybody, and the reason is because they have to play three of the best defenses in the NFL. So the Miami Dolphins acquired two of the top paid cornerbacks in the NFL now in Byron Jones and Xavier Howard. So they, they actually have three of the, t the highest paid cornerbacks in football. You're not going to throw on them. Um, so Sam Darnold's uh, going to be tough there. Plus, he's not throwing anybody. I mean, all these guys, Jamison Crowder at this point. The Bills defense is good. The Patriots defense didn't really get any worse in the offseason. And that's their games. So maybe with lesser quarterback play, you'll have more opportunities against it is, you know, maybe the theory there. But yeah, the defense hasn't gotten any or any worse or any better. No, no, right. And I mean, Le'Veon Bell, I think he played in 15 games last year. I think he might have missed one, but he, oh. 
He didn't have more than 800 yards rushing last year. Um, I I looked at their schedule halfway through the season last year, and another player in our league had him on his team, and I threw every trade imaginable at him to try and get Lamy on Bell because I was so in love with the schedule. He didn't go for it. And honestly, it worked out for the best because how he much of a letdown anything. they were. Yeah, right. I mean, even, even when their schedule got easier towards the end of last year, they he still didn't do anything. No, they yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, the so no, stay away from all the Jets. The, the only kind of good thing that he did, he had 66 catches last year. So, but I mean, that's that's it. I mean, yeah. stay, stay away from the Jets. So my team, same. Northeast region, I'm going to go with the Buffalo Bills. And what you guys, the listeners and viewers, if you're watching, will learn about me is one thing I care about more than I think a lot of other fantasy football analysts, players, people in your leagues, or maybe even you at home. One thing I care about more, and I actually put some stock into, is schedule. And when I'm drafting people, or when I'm in the middle of a season, I always have an eye towards who are these players playing weeks 14 through 16. If you have a week 17 championship, you need to leave that league. But if you're the commission, you need to change it right now. But who are these players playing weeks 14 through 16? I mean, let's be honest, getting into the top half of your league and making the fantasy playoffs, that's only half the battle. You know, the, the main the main course, if you will, is the fantasy football playoffs. And if you're sitting there facing, you know, three top 10 defenses in a row, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you had all season to try and get yourself out of this situation. Maybe pivot to another player or, you know, package something for a similar player. Same quality, but a much easier road to get you to a title. And if you look at the Bills this this season, they have a buy in week 11. So late buy, I don't love. I like to get my buys out of the way early and have my players. Week 11 buy, then you are at home against the San Diego Chargers. Then you fly across the country to play at San Francisco. And then you fly all the way back across the country to play the, the Pittsburgh Steelers at home. Top 10 defense last year, amazing defense, especially in the second half. And then your last game, uh, for your championship hopes is at home against New England. And we saw what New England did to the league last year. It was amazing. I think they were top 25 or top 35 in scoring, and that's across all positions or top 50 anyway. So yeah. I, I don't know why you would target a Bills player or not even that, but I think it's when you're drafting your team, you don't need to know who you're going to draft or, you know, you can have some favorites, but the biggest, and I think one of the best pieces of advice is you need to have an opinion on every player. And if you're looking at the Fon Diggs later or Devin Singletary or somebody else, and there's another player of the same caliber available sitting there, not on the bills, I am steering clear. So, now, with that said, if you put a gun to my head and said, which team am I avoiding? <laughs> it's the Jets. Let's, let's be the, the, yeah, they're just, <laughs> just, just, with, with all that being said, just it's the Jets. Hold it's, on. Where, where is it? The New York, where, where? It's the New York football Jets. Yeah. Oh, Jets. We got the poop emoji. Yeah. Oh, this is great. I can't wait to see the props for, for the next episode. But yes, I mean. I just, Le'Veon oh was such a colossal letdown, and i he's just going to be overdrafted again because everybody, and, when they see and think of Le'Veon, all they do is they think yeah. about the Steelers. And they think, well, Adam Gase didn't give him a fair shake. And But if you listen, all the offseason talk was about how Le'Veon should be traded, Le'Veon should be cut, Le'Veon, like, I don't want any part of that. The one thing I will say, I am guilty of having a Jet on my team. I, I think I had two Jets at one point last year. I believed in Sam Darnold to a point because he did show some promise 
prior to last season. He came back from his, you know, smooching disease that he had for, I think, longer than most people would have liked, the mono. But, uh, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't what anybody expected out of the Jets. And so Crowder was serviceable, top 40, top 50. If you're desperate at flex and you got half your team on by, throw him in. He's probably going to be on waivers. I think he's maybe a flex candidate without Robbie there this year, but it's not reliable. It, it yes. wasn't reliable. It wasn't reliable last year. It looked like he would go to Crowder. It looked like Darnold would go to Crowder. And then inexplicably, the next game, he would go to Robbie instead. And it, you got lucky. Uh, yep. This is the truth of it. I got lucky several times playing Crowder. Avoid, avoid, avoid. Absolutely. All right. So with that, what is one team that you want players on? What what team, if you're seeing two people or, uh, and you're like, oh, well, he plays for that team. I want him. I mean, for for me, it's the Steelers. Um, really? Yes. Yeah, oh, that's a hot all, take. Yeah. So so they're all going to be undervalued this year. Um, and I mean, remember Ben Roethlisberger is still one of the better quarterbacks in football. You know, if if you look at last year's projections, and you know, when we look at projections, you assume health for everybody, and the Steelers definitely did not have health last year once Ben got hurt and James Conner got hurt and Juju Smith Schuster got hurt, and you know, you're. You're two years removed from them being one of the the high powered offenses in football. I know Antonio Brown was there at the time, but provided a lot of those targets do go to Juju Smith Schuster, who was already a top ten wideout uh, two years ago. Okay, I was gonna say, where do you think? Where do you put Juju? Here, I want to do. Let's do either or. Uh, let's let's see this. Um, Juju Smith Schuster or Keenan Allen. Uh, I mean, provided health is there, I'm going to take Juju because he's got an experienced quarterback and you don't know who's throwing the ball to Keenan Allen. You know, and and their offense, they when he throws for 5,000 yards, he's got to throw to someone and it's going to be him and it's going to be James Conner and whoever else is their, their wide receivers. So what then, round? We're going to forget about the Steelers. That's who I want. What round do you think you can get James Conner? And what round do you think you can get Juju this year? Probably I mean, yeah, I mean, it just kind of depends. I mean, as, as things kind of evolve and we start seeing reports and, and where, you know, where some of these rookie running backs are, are getting drafted. And, and it, it also depends on what kind of league you're in. If there if there's full PPR, half PPR, no PPR, how do you score? You know, so you're probably looking at the third, probably some you know second or third round. And if you're getting a couple of those guys there that can be top 10 at their positions, I, I think the, those are two guys that people are going to kind of forget about and they're going to remind people what they got this year. Mm-hmm. So David Johnson or James Conner? Oh, man, I, probably James Conner. OK, Joe Mixon or James Conner? I hate Joe Mixon. OK. All right, so that's another James Conner. Aaron Jones with the newly drafted AJ Dillon behind him. Uh, Aaron Jones was number two last year. Uh, I mean, I think 16 touchdowns, so that's not right. And so, you know, if those touchdowns go down too much, you got AJ Dillon, you got Williams there as well. So yeah, I'm gonna take Aaron Jones, but you could easily see Conner scoring more points than him, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Given the situation and the fact that the Packers Drafted what I think is going to end up being a goal line. To me, right. I think that's the utilization you want. All right, last right. one for you: James Conner or Leonard Fournette? Oh, give me Fournette all day, man! Really? He was so good. You're a Fournette he had, fan? He had 76 catches last year. Yeah, but wasn't Jacksonville kind of like a dumpster Bad. fire? Yeah, but they they kind of waffled back and forth on quarterbacks. I mean, Fournette. I mean, I think the dude's crazy, but I mean, he he is a really good and productive. I wouldn't make him mad. He'll punch you in the face. No, yeah, I'm I'm going to avoid a lot of. I'm gonna that poop emoji's gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, 77 catches last year. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely take Fournette over him. Okay, all right. As for me, when I look at the team again, going back to the schedule and going back to last year's outcomes, the team that I want to target players on is the Baltimore Ravens. 
and they're already an amazing high-powered offense with Lamar Jackson. Yep. Let me tell you who they play weeks 14 through 16. Week 14, opening game, say you don't get a first round bye and you're playing in week 14 of your fantasy football playoffs. You have Mark Ingram, Lamar Jackson and company going up, uh, up against the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. That's a puff, puff schedule for yep. the first round. Second round, at home against Jacksonville. I think they're going to run over Jacksonville at home. And then, last last but not least, at home against the New York Giants. Yeah, that's pretty tasty. Who were awful last yeah. year. So I see, and and don't give me, don't give me J.K. Dobbins. I hear you, I hear you, all you fans of, of Dobbins. He's, to me, I think he's the running back of the future. But to me, I think Ingram's getting 20 touches, 15 to 20 touches easily every game this season. And you're going to see Dobbins a lot, but it's going to be in the fourth quarter when they're up by 30. And that's just, that's what it's going to be. That was this last season. It was Ingram slowed. And then Gus Edwards and company came in to finish the job. So I don't, I also don't anticipate Lamar going out and losing more games. Um, And there's been talk and scuttle even from Lamar about how he plans on running less this season. He plans on throwing more. I think realistically, Lamar drops back in the pocket. If he sees somebody open and he makes his checks, amazing. He's hit Mark Andrews was a revelation also last year. Now, the man can do some things with his legs that, to me, no other quarterback can do in the league. And so I think he recognizes that. I think Harbaugh and the team recognizes that. Um, I mean, they let Flacco go and he was fine. He was a fine quarterback and they let him go to put in Lamar just because of his raw talent. So to me, the playoff schedule, if I can get Mark Ingram in the, who I don't think gets any respect and then they drafted a running back. And so people are still going to completely disrespect Mark Ingram. I think you can get him second half of the third, maybe in the fourth round. I mean, I think that that's completely doable. So, I mean, I don't know if I want to pay the Lamar Jackson price. And what's that? First round. First round price. ah, See. Get 1,200 rushing yards last year. I think that in some leagues, he will be drafted in the first round. And it wouldn't surprise me. But. I think in more competitive leagues, you're still going to see him fall to back half of the second, just because guys want to have that RB1, RB2, and you have a lower return on investment between an RB1 and an RB2 or a wide receiver one and a wide receiver two versus playing quarterbacks based on their matchup and, and mix matching two or three different guys together. I mean, look at what Ryan Fitzpatrick did in the championship game last year, putting up more than 40 points. So... Not everybody is going to be willing to make that spend. Now, I don't know if Lamar is going to put up as many points as he did last year, but that's just my my thoughts. He led the league in touchdown passes last year. Absolutely. You, you know, you wouldn't think that's that's the case, but it was. So, yeah, he, he was unbelievable. I never would have put him up there. No. So, all right, moving on. What's the worst fantasy losses you've experienced? Uh, to date, I know you you've had uh, you've had a lot more than me. Uh, I mean, my my worst one was was losing on a last second interception. So. All right. So, for those of you who don't know, I have I have fallen on many fantasy football swords and had many daggers of fantasy football thrust into me at the end of seasons when winning and losing and points are crucial. So. The worst thing that has happened to me in fantasy football, I'm going to go with, I believe, 2009. I had Matt Ryan, and I want to say it was it was week 13. So I want to say it was the last game before the playoffs. And so seeding at this time was huge. And Matt Ryan was my quarterback. They get up big week 13. What does he do? He kneels down. I lose my football game, my fantasy football matchup on a Matt Ryan 
fourth quarter kneel down. I lose by 0.2 points. Affects the seeding of the fantasy football playoffs. I lose my first round by <laughs> on a Matt Ryan kneel down. And then based on the seeding, I eventually get matched up in the first round with the player who goes on to win the entire thing. And maybe had I had the first round by, he would have been on the other side of the, the playoffs altogether and I could have gotten farther along. Um, I've made but, several. But, but luck has nothing to do with fantasy football. So. Right, exactly. Now you can't predict kneel downs. If I knew going into that game, uh, it was the worst letdown. The other thing I think I've done a little bit too much of, and I think a lot of people are guilty of is, and I'm trying to do less of it now, is trading for names. People put a lot of stock into names. I had Devonta Freeman when he was the number one running back in the league. This is what, four or five years ago. And I I was in love with, with Eddie Lacey. <laughs> and I had this running back who was completely unheard of. And so what did I do? I traded him after a couple good games and I said, give me Eddie Lacy, give me the Packers offense. He's gonna take me to the championship. Eddie Lacy played in probably four games that season, and Devonta was the number one back in the league. So I, I, I think oh. I think you're legally obligated to call him fat Eddie Lacy. I yeah, I didn't want to insult the man. As one big guy to another, not trying to insult you, Eddie, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, what about you? Any uh cream letdowns, meltdowns? No, only only good things have happened to me. I don't I don't, I don't know why. And then I, I I have one more. I had Ladanian Tomlinson the week or the the season he set the NFL rushing touchdown record, and uh, he carried me all the. This is my second season ever playing fantasy football. He carried me all the way to the championship game, and then didn't play, and I got destroyed. I I do you remember who beat me? Do you remember who won the league that year? He's pointing to himself, ladies and gentlemen, the handsome Alex Krogh. Yes, Alex did beat me that year. There were, that was me. This was back in our very younger years, and we're talking, again, 15 years ago. And so there's a lot of more of middle school, high school shenanigans going on in fantasy football then than I think our league would ever put up with now. Not that people don't threaten to quit on you every uh. year. Notwithstanding, but <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, we won't we we won't talk about any of games. We're good. Yeah, no shenanigans. So yeah, <clears throat> moving on. What rookie are you most excited for this? Uh, pre pretty easy answer. Um, it is Clyde Edwards Hilaire, uh, rookie running back for the Chiefs. Like it. um, it's uh, he, he's the guy. I mean. Kansas City running backs. Uh, Is he the guy, though? Well, I that's, mean, I mean, that's the thing. Well, of rookies, yes. I, I'm never gonna, never gonna trust a rookie wide receiver. Uh, ever. Running back. Oh yeah. no. Okay, you just okay. You just yeah. No, wide receivers. It, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm never gonna trust a, a rookie wide receiver. Your rookie quarterbacks. Joe Burrow will be fine. There's enough, uh, you know, experienced quarterbacks you're gonna take before him. You know, maybe a, a late round flyer, whatever. He could be good. It, but it's, do you think Edwards Hilaire position. will be the clear cut number one for the Chiefs? He doesn't have to be uh, to, to still be the most productive. Okay. Rookie. I mean, you're so over the last five years, Kansas City running backs in total have averaged approximately uh, 300 fantasy points. Um, if if that's okay. one. That puts him at RB2 last year. The the only time that, that Kansas City under Andy Reid has had one running back was Kareem Hunt, who... I, had him. I drafted yeah. him in the third, and everybody went nuts when I drafted right. Kareem Hunt in the third round. Now, yeah, where, I mean, So then where are to, you taking Edward Hilaire? I mean, probably in the... I, to get him, you're probably going to have to get him in the second. Um, oh, you think you got to spin up a... Man, I, that won't be yeah, good. Then. Because because people like you are gonna jump up and grab him because he he's in the best offense. Not at the number two. Not in the second round. I'm I, the hype train. I, I'm not saying I'm gonna take him there. I'm just right. saying 
get him, you're, you're going to have to potentially go up and, and, and get him that early um, because people love their rookie running backs and like hitting on those things. You know, you, you just said you took Kareem Hunt in the third and everyone went crazy. That was considered a reach at that point. So similar to to this with Clyde Edwards Hilaire, um, to get him, you're you're gonna have to to take him early because the hype train's absolutely out of control. I would also like to point out that, you know, in Andy Reid's offense, running backs have, have averaged 62 receptions out of the backfield uh, under his kind of leadership. And Clyde Edwards Hilaire had 55 catches last year at LSU. Wow, I didn't realize so he had that many. Yeah, so he, he really fits their style offense. Huh. And and another weapon where, you know, you're, you're going to have Hill, Watkins, Kelsey, uh, Robinson. I mean, you just have burners all over the place and they're worried about you throwing 50 yards over their head. There's going to be a lot of room for him to operate in space, um, both running the ball underneath and, and catching little short passes, which seems to be an Andy Reid offense special. How tall is he and how much does he weigh? So he's he's five nine two twelve, which is actually bigger. Oh, than that's th- that's thick for somebody five nine. Yeah, it's it's thick. Uh, I, I looked I looked up kind of comps, and Maurice Jones Drew was only two oh seven. Wow. So he's he's bigger than Maurice Jones Drew. Maurice Jones Drew ran a four three nine. Uh, Edwards Hilaire ran a four six. Uh, the the I mean the, the clear comp and, and Andy Reid's talked about it is you know comparing him to, to Brian Westbrook uh, back of, back in his old Eagles coaching days. Brian Westbrook was an inch taller, uh, 10 pounds less, and he, he basically ran the exact same 40 time. Um, and, and he was a guy that, you know, rushing, receiving, top five uh, running back that you'd want pretty much for, you know, for a three or four year stretch there. Provided that, you know, I'm not going to say he's Kareem Hunt, but Damian Williams is in a contract year. Um, he never stays healthy. Darwin Thompson and Daryl Williams isn't really doing it for me. So you, you could really see a breakout year for uh, Edwards Hilaire for sure. Do you think that Edwards Hilaire gets the goal line carries? I mean, if he does, look out. True, true. You know, I mean, then then I think you could easily justify that second round pick. If he gets the goal line carries, yes. If he doesn't, you know. If they're doing knows? jet sweep motion kind of stuff, I think Edwards Hilaire could be in. I think that it's it really depends on the tempo if they're trying to go big on big and you know run right up the gut i'm not sure if edwards hilaire is going to be the the back that's carrying the ball at that point right but i'm not sure that that's the andy reed type offense so i guess i think that edwards hilaire certainly has a chance to be the offensive rookie of the year now will he be i don't think so because i think it's going to be my guy as Keyshawn vaughn now, Keyshawn Vaughn, 5'10", 215, or 540-yard dash. He caught 30 balls for 270 yards and a touchdown. He's, again, drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Excuse me, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Get that right. Get that right. But I think as somebody who reviews the rookie running backs and generally always targets one because they have a ton of upside and you generally get them at a discount because they're huge question marks and they can be hit or miss. I am a rookie running back connoisseur. Last year I had Josh Jacobs and Miles Sanders. I had AP his rookie year. Missed out on Zeke. What are you going to do? But what I look for when I evaluate rookie running backs, to me, the number one thing is just opportunity. What is the rest of the depth chart? And do I think that this running back could potentially be a three down back? And when I look at Keyshawn Vaughn and I look at the Tampa Bay running back room, it's looking a little bare in the running back room. And I think Keyshawn Vaughn has a supreme opportunity to really grab the reins on that, be a three down back and, and honestly benefit from the Bruce Arians, Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. There's so many weapons. It's it's arguably the number one wide receiver core in the entire league with Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, and company. So you put OJ Howard on that. Now Gronk, just magically yep. a wild Gronk appears. And then you have <laughs> Keyshawn Vaughn and Tom Brady. I, I don't know how you go wrong. I really don't. And so maybe you argue that he's not going to get the touchdowns because there's too many other players that are, yep. you know, 
more well-renowned or more skilled, and there's too many mouths to feed, and I get that. All I'm saying is, when he gets the ball, there's not gonna be an eight-man box. Never gonna happen. And so I think he's gonna have room to run. Now there is Ronald Jones there, and between him and Peyton Barber, it just left so much to be desired. I think that they finally have their workhorse back. I'm looking forward to Keyshawn Vaughn. Hey, any anytime you want to bet on uh, who has more yards and touchdowns, I'm, I'm more than willing to wager. We need a board. So, we need to do yeah. it. So bring, bring that on. Hmm. Uh, and then I, I, I guess as we we kind of wrap up our debut episode, I, I think we're gonna make it uh, to to the end here. Thankfully. I- we're getting close. Coronavirus has really impacting a lot of us. And, you know, for me, I, I complain about having a long beard, having long hair, whatever. You know, that's that's so minor. You know, just just wanted to, to say thanks to the people that are are doing all the hard work, doing doing the heavy lifting in the hospitals, and you know, a, a lot of people are doing the heavy lifting by staying at home. I know it's it's really tough for a lot of people. You know, even, even you, Jason. You know, you uh, your wedding was scheduled to be next next weekend, and I know that. You know, you've had to put that off. So I, I know you're you're dealing with a lot of things on your end. Yeah, we uh, to say that we've been impacted by the coronavirus is, I think, putting it mildly. Now, knock on wood, I personally have not lost anyone that I know to yep. the virus, but we've certainly been impacted. Uh, for those of you not watching the YouTube version of this, my shirt says "Real Men Marry Nurses." Now I am engaged to a nurse. She's currently at work. I am at home alone with three dogs. It's amazing. I haven't heard any barking and everybody's quiet and laying down (laughs) and letting me film. So we were actually supposed to get married one week from today. Um, Our wedding has now been rescheduled for June of 2021. So we're looking forward to that. We've rescheduled honeymoons and bachelor parties were virtual and all of that that goes along with it. At this point, we're, we just try to stay positive and we're just saying as long as people are able to get in room and who knows if people will even be able to, you know, next summer, who knows how long this goes. People can speculate all they want, but does anybody really know? So we're, we're just trying to stay hopeful, trying to stay upbeat. We're hoping that June 2021 is a great summer. We're able to do this thing, get the knot tied. We've had a lot of uh, family be impacted. My fiance's sister is actually living full-time at a nursing facility where she's the nursing coordinator. Once they had their first case diagnosed, she actually took it upon herself to move into the facility, tell some Uh, other nursing staff to just stay home with your families, be safe. This minimizes exposure. She lives in one of the empty rooms. And so that way it helps to protect staff and residents alike. So I have my fiance on the front line every day here at a local hospital. And then her sister is also doing everything she can to help fight this. I work from home full-time remote right now. I can't believe that I've been home for close to two months. I'm going stir crazy. I miss meetings and offices and everything that goes along with that. Alex, I think that we're not for the coronavirus. Again, another positive, if you want to call it that out of all of this, I think we're not for the coronavirus. I don't know if we would be sitting here filming this right now a week before I'm supposed to get married. So right. Yeah, probably not. There, would be a good guess. There's, yeah. there's a lot of takeaways. And so if this is something that helps us be productive and helps people take their minds off of what's going on for an hour a week, then I think yep. we're doing a great job. And if all it is, is us talking about fantasy football and prop emojis and everything else for an hour. So we get distracted, then, Hey, that's great for us too. So <laughs> exactly. All right. Now with that, I, uh, I do want to ask everybody listening and watching to follow us. We are at the FF Sackos on all social media platforms. We thank you for tuning in and I think we are going to sign out. Alex, I'll give you any last words. Peace. Peace. We're out.